Do you ever feel like Martin Luther King or, or Mother Teresa or Mahatma Gandhi reincarnates time and again in this movement? Thank you. Thank you so very much. Whew. Wow, now we've got another one. Peter Hammerstedt has saved hundreds of whales from illegal Japanese whalers and has fought sealing and destructive fishing practices during his five years with Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. He's been held hostage by Ecuadorian fishermen, physically attacked by sealers, assaulted and arrested by the Canadian Coast Guard, involved in the sideswiping of an illegal whaling ship and rammed by another, and has pulled up miles of fishing long line. Please welcome Peter Hammerstedt. Well, thank you very much for having me here again. It's been about three years since I've been to one of these events, and I'm always so incredibly inspired to hear about all of the success stories that we as a movement have. The question on everybody's lips at the Sea Shepherd table has been about Captain Paul Watson. And I'm sure most of you have heard that about three months ago, Captain Paul Watson was arrested in Frankfurt in Germany. He was arrested on a bogus extradition request by the Costa Rican government, which is directly related to how effective Sea Shepherd has been in saving sharks from illegal fishing practices in Latin America. Captain Paul Watson has been my captain for 10 years. He's a dear, dear friend of mine. And I never thought I'd have to go visit him in jail. But when I visited him in jail and I asked him, I said, you know, what you would ask a friend, you know, Paul, how are you doing? Um, how's the food? Are you getting enough to eat? You, do you get to go outside? Paul just completely ignored any question I asked him. And rather, he replied by asking, hey, Peter, how are we doing getting a fourth ship to Antarctica? And Peter, what's the Bridget Bardot doing in, in the South Pacific? How many sharks are we saving there? So rather than talk a great deal about Captain Paul Watson's case, I know that from the time he was arrested to the time he was put on house arrest, to the time now when he's on the run, being sought for extradition now from two countries, Costa Rica and Japan, I know that Captain Paul Watson's number one concern is how we take this as an opportunity to rather focus on what Sea Shepherd does and what we as a movement do, which is saving lives and saving lives directly. So what I wanted to talk about is I think the victories that we have as a movement are, we rarely talk about them because we're so busy moving on to the next campaign or continuing what we do. And yet sometimes these, these battles that we fight can seem so insurmountable. And whether it's doing the great work that vegan outreach groups do, or whether it's closing this gulag of despair and torment that Huntington Life Sciences represents, or getting the beagles out of Green Hill, whatever it might be, I don't think we celebrate our victories enough. And the one thing that Captain Paul Watson has taught me in my 10 years with Sea Shepherd is that the number one thing that we have to do to win is simply to show up. And that 90% of all of our successes is simply showing up. And that's why what I wanted to talk about during my plenary here is about a campaign that I've been an integral part of um, which is stopping the Canadian seal hunt and really bringing about what was <laughs> what was the single largest mass slaughter of a marine mammal species in the world and is now really a shadow of its former self. A battle that's been fought for more than 45 years by a wide range of groups, not, not just Sea Shepherd, from people going out on the ice and painting these seals, thereby destroying the value of their furs, to blocking sealing boats in harbor in Newfoundland and preventing them from going out to the killing fields, to doing lobbying efforts and demonstrations at Canadian consulates around the world. For 45 years, people, all of you, we have all campaigned to stop the seal hunt, and about three years ago, we achieved a tremendous success in that. And that success was achieved simply by undying, unwavering persistence and never thinking that our goals are unachievable. I first got involved in trying to stop the Canadian seal hunt in 2005 
uh, myself and several crew members, there were about 11 of us, were arrested on the ice. And in Canada, it's unlawful to be within half a nautical mile of the seal hunt. It's about 926 meters. And the reason for that is that the Canadian government had something to hide. They did not want people to go out and get video footage of the fact that 62% of these baby harp seals, these four to six week old pups, were being skinned while still alive. And so, this, so the Canadian government passed this legislation called, ironically, the, the Seal Protection Act, which was really the Sealer Protection Act. And, and Sea Shepherd would go up year after year along with a number of other groups um, to try to get that footage out. In 2008, we were really at a, a turning point, and that turning point was that we, along with many other groups, knew that the European Parliament was considering banning the importation of all seal skin. And Captain Paul Watson knew that the one thing Sea Shepherd is very good at doing is attracting an incredible amount of media attention on the issues. And thankfully, we had this rust bucket of a boat, I mean, this dreadful North Sea trawler that could only do about nine knots on a very, very good day. And we really needed to retire this ship. And retiring a ship is very, very expensive. It costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to scrap a boat. And Captain Paul Watson decided what better way to get rid of it than let the Canadian government get rid of it for us. <laughs> and not only that, what better way but to have them scrap it for us too. And, and in the meanwhile, end the seal hunt while doing it. So Captain Paul Watson asked myself and, and Captain Alex Cornelson whether we would take the ship up to the ice flows of Canada and get the ship arrested. I figured it wouldn't be that hard to do. And I asked, you know, I asked Captain Paul Watson, I said, well, what do you want us to do? We're going to get up there. There's going to be you know, a Canadian Coast Guard boat. They're going to tell us you've got to keep half a nautical mile away. Well, what do you want us, what do you want us to tell them when, when that happens? And Paul thought about it for a little bit. And then he says, well, you tell them like in the Western movies. You know, in the Western movies, they say, we don't need no, we don't need no stinking badges. So tell them, tell them you don't need no stinking permits. Four days later, we're in the ice flows of Canada. There's a bunch of these barbarian, these bloodthirsty seal clubbers out on the ice. We're circling them with our rust bucket vessel. The ice is breaking underneath their feet. Cameras are rolling. And these sealers retreat onto the vessel. These seals that are in that area right there and there were safe simply because we showed up and because we were there. Lo and behold, the call came that we expected, although it wasn't one Canadian Coast Guard vessel. There were two Canadian Coast Guard icebreakers, one naval vessel, two Canadian Coast Guard helicopters, a plane from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, and a plane from the Canadian Coast Guard as, as well. All, all to, to, get these, to get these vegans and vegetarians on this really slow boat with their cameras. It blew my mind. But I knew we were being effective. And so the call came. I heard it on the Marine VHF channel, channel 16. I hear Farley Mowat, this is the Canadian Coast Guard vessel George R. Perks, you are instructed to keep half a nautical mile away at all times. So I'm thinking, what did Paul tell me in Bermuda? So I answer and I say, you know, George R. Perks is the Farley Mowat, we are a Dutch flagged vessel, we are in international waters. To be frank, sir, we don't need no stinking permits. <laughs> and was met with silence, <laughs> but 30 seconds later, I mean, they knew who I was. Here I was, this 21-year-old kid, and, but it must have been like the Wizard of Oz, because here was this boat, tell, this big vessel telling them that we weren't going to move. So they reply back after, after about 30 seconds. They say, all right, sir, we're going to have to let you know you're currently in violation of the Seal Protection Act, and uh, we're going to have to take enforcement action against you. So I reply back and I say, well, the, you know, the only crime here is a crime against nature, the, the brutal slaughter of the harp seal, and uh, we have every right to be here. And then started the waiting game. And what we did, we had 19 crew on board, we had a tally on the board in the mess, and every day we had a, we had a, yes, uh, a yes folder and a no folder. And we tried to take bets on how long it would take for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police to board the vessel. Day one happened and there were about five votes yes that they would board that day and about 14 votes no. About five days later there were 18 votes yes and my incredibly naive vote no. 
And half an hour later, a SWAT team of 15 uh, RCMP officers boarded the vessel at gunpoint, seized the vessel, and took Captain Alex Cornelson and myself to, to jail in Canada. The Minister of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada was feeling very proud of himself. He went out in the media and said, you know, what Captain Paul Watson needs to know is that there's a new white urban town. <laughs> and was subsequently dismissed from office when two weeks later, Captain Paul Watson congratulated him on retiring the vessel on our behalf. <laughs> but <clears throat> Captain, uh, Captain Alex Cornelson and I, we were taken to our respective uh, interrogations. We were drilled for about six hours by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Serious Crimes Unit. Uh, these guys accused us of coming to Canada to plan the next 9-11. I was accused of being a 12-year-old Palestinian boy walking into a supermarket in Tel Aviv with a backpack full of nails. And after six hours, I just refused to even acknowledge that they were in the room. I didn't even talk to them. It was very easy. People often see this video on YouTube that's out about this interrogation, and they say, oh, what a great thing. I mean, I, I was asleep for half the time. It's not that <laughs> admirable. But after six hours, this guy comes in, and he's absolutely drenched in sweat, and he's very, very tired. He recognizes I'm not going to say anything, so he lets me go. I hear him speaking to the other interrogating officer who'd been dealing with Alex Cornelson, and they say, hey, did you get anything from Cornelson? And he goes, no, no, Cornelson wouldn't say anything. How about Hammerstedt? Did you get anything from Hammerstedt? The guy says, no, nothing. And then I hear them mutter under their breath, wow, these seal huggers are tougher to crack than the Hell's Angels. <laughs> Fact is, three days later, Alex Cornelson and myself were deported from Canada. We're never allowed to return. It's, uh, I'm not that upset about it. But, um, but what happened with this was a tremendous amount of media attention was garnered. Not just media attention in Canada, but media attention in the Netherlands, media attention in all these other European Union countries where we needed to mobilize support with the European Union parliamentarians to get this ban passed. And three months later, the European Union passed this ban. And overnight, <laughs> overnight, the price per pelt of seal went from $70 a pelt to $7 a pelt. We went from having 320,000 baby harp seals brutally slaughtered in Canada to last year, or this year, I think it was about 35 to 40,000, which is still a incredible amount and completely unacceptable, but it is a shadow of what it was, was. And together, we as a movement brought that industry down to its knees. <laughs> so to wrap up, the point I was trying to make is that we really didn't have to do very much. All we had to do was show up. All we had to do was bring a vessel there, ignore a bunch of radio calls, get arrested and then not say anything, and then just get a free ticket from Canada back home. <laughs> and I think oftentimes we think that these things are so insurmountable, we have to go to these demos and we go to these uh, home demos and we, we do these lobbying efforts and we do hand out vegan outreach pamphlets, and we're so focused and concerned with what that tangible result is, but when we look at it in a large scale perspective, we recognize that in the end, we as a movement always do win. And the successes that we have for these animals who do not have anybody to defend themselves other than us are really countless. And that's why I know that even though Captain Paul Watson, my boss, is on the run, he's in hiding, he's being sought for extradition in three countries, even though I know that the Japanese whaling industry has a $30 million security budget now that was taken deliberately from the Tsunami Relief Fund specifically to stop Sea Shepherd, I know that last year we prevented 729 whales from being slaughtered in Antarctica. The year before that, we saved 863 whales from slaughter. I know that we bankrupted the Japanese whaling industry two times in a row. I know... I, I know that we have them on the ropes, and I know that this next campaign we're going to do, Operation Zero Tolerance, where we'll send this fleet of ships back home earlier than ever before. We'll send them back with a zero kill quota. We'll save 1,035 whales in the whale sanctuary and give the word sanctuary the actual respect and recognition that it deserves.
we will shut down whaling in Antarctica, whaling worldwide, just like we did with the sealing industry in Canada, and it is because of every single one of you supporting us and doing your actions and recognizing that these animals deserve our respect, these animals deserve our defense, and we are in the best position to give them that. So thank you.